grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome today. We're looking at the topic Christ as the face of God. Christ as the face of God. Everything that God is is actually in the person of Christ. So when we talk about anything that is of God, Christ is the substance and the reality of it. We talk about the wisdom of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God. Christ is the glory of God. Christ is the light of God. Christ is the dwelling or the abode of God, the temple of God, the tabernacle of God, the love of God towards humanity, the life of God. And so, but we are looking at Christ as the face of God. That is the reality. That is the visibility of God to humanity. And this nails it in John 14 verse 9. John 14 verse 9 is the scripture of the Lord said, Jesus said to him, and that is to Philip, I have, which is also to us as well. I have been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip. And it is a question I think every day of our life, there is because of the infiniteness of our Lord. There is no no one no one will ever grab ev grabs everything that he is. He has to be unfolding different dimensions or different aspects of him to us. So we maintain a posture in our work with God and the Christian faith to know more about him. Maybe that's why Philippians 3, the Lord uh, Paul said that, that I may know him. So still on John chapter 9, chapter 14, verse 9. So he who has seen me has seen the Father. And he, and how can you say, show us the Father? So essentially, the Father shows himself in Christ. The mystery of God is that God is threefold in person with one essence. One God, three persons. It's a mystery. That mystery is on the mystifiable, the mystifiable on this side of eternity, <laughs> the Trinity or the Trinitarian or the triunity of God, the tripartite being of the person of God as well. God is one, but we have Him as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But that's a deep, deep topic right there. I'm not going to try to delve into that on this topic because we've had some other videos through a lot of the materials from the church fathers and but today we are focusing on him as the face of god christ so christ is called the face of god and of course we say this in second corinthians chapter 4 which i could even go in there second corinthians chapter 4 so the face of god and you know when we say the face of a person indirectly what we are trying to say the what was the face of a person when you look at a person you're not really looking at your stomach or their hand you're looking at them when you're communicating with them so when we are communicating communicating with god we look at christ christ is the face god has given to us in his triune unity that's why it's the embodiment of the father so i will have gone to exodus 33 14 but let me read second corinthians chapter 4 from verse verse 6 for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let me now go to Exodus 33, Exodus 33 verse 14. And this was the encounter with Moses with God when he said God should show him his glory. And God said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. We learned that that presence in Exodus 33 signifies face, looks, form or appearance. And of course, that can be corroborated by other aspects in scriptures like Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. We could look at that as well where Christ is, uh, the scripture said, He is the image of the invisible God. That is, is the visibility of the invisible God. So Christ is the God, the Father is eternally hidden. He, is, he unhides himself in Christ and unknowable. God prides himself in that dimension that God is hidden. The Lord said it. No one has seen the Father except the Son. And so it's a scriptural fact that God is eternally hidden and he is unknowable except he reveals himself. And so eternally hidden means that um, God, um, let me go to Isaiah 45 where God categorically said it there that the scripture said that God hides himself he hides himself and um, not for uh, he hides himself for good reasons and because he, more of the reason maybe for man to search him out uh, Isaiah 45 verse uh, verse 15 Isaiah 45 verse 15 yeah Isaiah 45 verse 15 truly you are a God who hide yourself O God 
of Israel. So God, Isaiah 45, 15, the scripture said, Truly you are God who hide yourself, O God of Israel and Savior. So he unhides himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the word became flesh in the person of Christ. So when God speaks to us, the word of God is now God revealing himself to us. And Christ as the face of God is the word of God by which we behold God himself and that's how our transformation coming to be. So outside of Christ, no man by searching can find God. God is God is unmeetable outside of Christ. God is unknowable outside of Christ. God is un, uh, unapproachable outside of Christ. It is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ we meet with God. And somebody might ask, why is this? It's because Christ is God. God, like he said in John 14, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. It's a mystery, the mystery of the Trinity, how they co in here in one another. We're using they because God uses we, plural tense, for himself. But it's not three gods that we have. It's one God, but we have it it's mysteriously as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So when it's acting as the Son, my own understanding, my own intercourse, it's a whole lot of things when it comes to the Trinitarian of God. People have argued that the Sabinism, the Tritrism, but I'm not going into there. But God doesn't cease to be the Father as Him, as the Son. And God, He doesn't cease to be the Son with Him as the Spirit. It's a mystery because as the Father is acting, the Son and the Spirit are involved. If the Spirit is acting, the Father and the Son are involved. The Son is acting, the Father and the Spirit are also involved. So direct knowledge of God is impossible without Christ because that's how He brings the revelation of God to man, that the Word became flesh and we behold Him. And so we see that He is the revealed word to God and it's not just on the New Testament because the New Testament is his incarnation of the flesh and the, even from eternity past he didn't wasn't born into existence because he's eternal God himself so true Christ person the invisible God is finally revealed and um, let's put it this way God has revealed himself but there's no end to the revelation of God you and I need a fresh dimension of the revelation of God. So we're going through different seasons in life, I'm going through seasons, you're going through every one of us, every human have seasons they are going through. And so in every season there is a revelation of God that is allocated for that season that we need in order to come out as overcomers in that season. And so Christ is the person that reveals God to us. So let it not be that, oh, I'm safe now, I know God. No, no, no. There are many dimensions we, we need to know to move to the next step. So he reveals the invisible God finally through him. So over a matter, a situation, God is healer, for example, and someone might be uh, trusting in God, believing for healing. And God now reveals himself as a healer in the face of Jesus Christ. So every situation any man will go through, God will always reveal himself in the face of Jesus Christ. So it could be Christ, God revealing himself as the shepherd in the face of Jesus Christ. So in Christ, God becomes visible and everything else in, and everything else comprehendable. So in Christ, God becomes very visible, visible in terms of real, tangible to man. And don't mean like physical, like we're not seeing him physically today, but he has unveiled himself through his word in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Christ, God becomes visible and everything else becomes comprehensible. That is, we understand God by looking at Christ. We see God by seeing Christ. We experience God by experiencing Christ. So in Christ, God becomes visible and everything else becomes mm -hmm. that he makes himself real. Whether it's the wisdom of God, the power of God, God has made himself real in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ is the face of God before whom all things are naked and open. So all things are naked and open before the eyes of God. And it's, we there are so many expression that God uses in scriptures but we can't just take them literally uh, like the face of God the hands of God God has hands he has legs according to what scriptures but it's not the way we have I don't think God's eyes are like us or else you can't see everything going on in the universe here but God uses these terminologies so that we can we he can relate with us so that we can understand what he's saying or else it will be so abstract that we won't be able to know or be able to relate or commune with him so 
Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, and but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, to whom we must give an account. That's why it's the judge of the earth, is the judge of the living and the dead. So God has unveiled himself. All things are naked and open before him. So there's nothing, his there is omnipresent, is everywhere. So beholding his face is an exploration into all of God. So beholding the face of God. Is looking at Christ. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse eighteen, uh, chapter three, eighteen says that as we behold Him as in a glass in the mirror, we are being transformed from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of by the Spirit of the Lord, by the Lord Spirit, a compound title for the Lord now as the Spirit is a very very mystery that He is the one that we behold. How do we behold the face of God? Principally by looking at the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God letting his word dwell in our hearts because it is as we behold that word that god is revealed to us in that season in that situation in that experience we are going through so every one of us we always need a fresh revelation of god because we are going through life and they are we're coming across fresh seasons in life so to say circumstances situation it might be the same old situation but there are fresh insights from god that we need to be able to deal or overcome in such situation he is the manifestation of all divine attributes so when we hear about the patience of god the love of god when we hear about the glory of god when we hear about the righteousness of god when we hear about the life of God, every attribute of God, wisdom, power, every sovereignty of God, I mean the, the aseity of God, we're talking about every attribute we can ever the providence of God, it is actually in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the manifestation of such. Maybe that's why First Corinthians tells us that it is the power and the wisdom of God. It is the life of God. I am the way, the truth, and the life is the truth of God. So everything that is of God goes onto the person of Christ. So the man, so if I want to experience the wisdom, I always need the wisdom of God. You will always need the wisdom of God. We will always need the power of God. We will always need this attribute of God. And God has said to us that the way for the manifestation of his attributes is in his son. That's why Christ in us, the hope of glory. He is also the embodiment of the divine essence. That's the nature of God that is we are now partakers of the divine nature and the nature actually is what God intends to impart into us so that's why the scripture says that they um, that, that we are partakers of the divine nature so the nature or the essence of an orange is the juice the juice is what substantially adds value to anyone partaking of the orange so that essence and nature is actually the life of God who is no other than the very person of Christ so his face is the radiation of the glory of God I could read that from Hebrews chapter 1 Christ as the effulgence the extreme brightness of the of the brightness of God Hebrews chapter 1 verse let me from verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in various manners spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophet, as in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the wars. Verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself caught our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on earth. So he is the, the express, the radiation of the glory of God is also the character of God. The character of God is reflected in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we mean the character, we mean the, the nature. It means qualities. Again, you don't want to use this word nature, qualities, habits, uh, uh, traits, and because God is beyond all those things, but we have to borrow from our, our skewed human language to describe He who is indescribable. In Him, the wisdom of God is personified. That is, the person of the wisdom of God will meet it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The manifold wisdom of God, the wisdom that, uh, that, that created the heavens and the earth, the wisdom by which God uses to rule and to reign in His kingdom. He is the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That first Corinthians 1 also talks about God. It is of God. We are in Christ Jesus, who is made unto us wisdom from God. 
wisdom from God. So in him is the wisdom of God personified. In him also is the righteousness of God imputed. It is through him. God's righteousness comes to us. I read that from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Romans 4 as well, Romans 5 as well, about the righteousness of God, that how God, through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, has imputed into us a right standing with him. That is, we can appear before God as though we had never sinned. It's because we are now members of Christ. We died with him in baptism and receiving into our Lord. So our life is no longer our life. Our life is now Christ living through us. So through him also the power of God is experienced. So to experience the power of God, to experience the might, the omnipotence of God, the dominion of God, it is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything that we ever think in experiencing of God, in enjoying of God, in partaking of God, is always by default going back to Christ. Why? Because in Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So exalting Christ is exalting God. Honoring Christ is honoring the Father. I mean, meeting Christ is meeting the Father because the Father is in Him. There's no other way you will meet the Father except in Him. So in Him, the life of God is also dispensed. Because as the life of God, which is uh, my one of the key elements of the key part of Himself, God desires to give to humanity. And that's why in uh, Genesis chapter 2, God said that the tree of life pointed man to the tree of life man disobeyed but god brought back that tree of life in the person of christ and the new in his incarnation that i have come that they may have life and they have it abundantly so what god is hoping to what god desires to dispense into man is his life and that life comes to man through the person of christ and that's why I said that, 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 that if anyone that come unto me, all you that labor and every lady, and now we give you rest. That rest is in this life. It's the peace of God. It's everything of God that we need. It's actually the good land. The reality of the good land or promised land, God was bringing the Israelites to which we now, the church, God has brought us into. So in beholding His face, we behold all things. So it appears the way God has designed our Christian experience or our walk with Him is such that our focus should be on, it gives us one focus. He said, if your eye be single, your whole body will be full of light. So God gives us the focus of Christ. He said, looking onto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Because in looking at Christ, we are lighting to see every other area we need to see in the season and the situation we are going through. So we overcome not by trying, not, not by investing our time and energy on a plethora of things. God says one thing is needful. We focus on Him and He ordains and others our part. He dispenses Himself into us and leads us into doing what is most profitable or what is most uh, productive, fruitful. In that season so it is his face we behold in prayers to the father and that's the authority he has given to us in his name because when we come to the father in prayer what we're essentially doing is like we are praying in the stead of Christ so part of the authority we have is like we can decree things on earth here because we are doing it as his regent as a member of his body and of course to do that we are aware about his will we are aware about his plans in that period and he, by his spirit now is making declaration we are making intercession to the father because it's not just we are just praying empty we are just praying for ourselves alone but we are finding out from him what is he that he wants to do what is the plan what is the will of the father then we are giving voice to it on the earth here so his face is the source of the spirit's life and second corinthians 3 17 also talks about that now the Lord is the Spirit. First Corinthians 15 45 B says that the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Revelations 2, Revelation 3, the, the Lord spoke to those seven churches and he kept say, kept on addressing himself as the spirit that he that has and hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. So to experience the spirit of God, it is through Christ. To meet with the Father, it is through Christ. 
So the eye of faith should ever be directed to him who is the face of God. So every part of our eye of faith should be directed to him because he is the face of God. The face of God in the terms of he is, God is made known through him. So faith is essentially looking unto him, the author of the faith and the finisher and also the sustainer of our faith. The moment we take our gaze away from him and start looking at the situation, it will appear like the storm or the boisterous wind would probably get the better of that person but we keep looking at him we set our focus on him not that we are unmindful not that not that we are, we are ignoring what is around situations circumstances but we know to change those situations is by looking onto him who has also who has the sovereign power to change things his existence is from the remotest remoteness of eternity that is like it's not it didn't come into being when creation came into being he created the creation so christ is not another creature <laughs> it's because god had to manifest in the flesh and god manifests in the flesh is the person of christ was he existing before he manifested in the flesh yes 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 <laughs> he has existed before there was any creation because god had been trying from eternity past there will be no need for God to be revealed if there were no creatures outside of the Godhead to behold Him. And because if God will be so abstract, God will be an impersonal deity to us because we can't relate our fellowship with an abstract being. <laughs> so, but God has made Himself known to us and that's why a lot of the types and shadows in the Old Testament were revealing Christ, were making uh, God, the hell was God giving figures, um, uh, symbolic signs of things, uh, allegories, for example, from the tree of life in Genesis 2, and talking about the seed of the woman who will come to Noah's ark, talking about the ram that Abraham, that God used to replace Isaac, and even the persons in the, in the Old Testament, a lot of the Bible characters there that God was using, they were, they were typifying Christ. The kings, I'm not talking about their bad behavior, but the office, the priest, because it's the priest after the order of Mekisedek, the Lord Jesus Christ. And also the prophet. He is the prophet through which Hebrews chapter 1 is the one that God speaks through. So Christ could not be our savior if he isn't the face of God. Because only God can save man. Only God can atone for man before God. Only deity. This is, this is too sacred a work. Our salvation is too sacred. That's why there's no other name by which men may be saved except in Christ. So it is only in the face of Jesus Christ that God could save us. And so that's how He is our Savior because He is the face of God. He is the uh, the, the contact point, the, the uh, other First Timothy chapter 2, the mediator, the one mediator between God and and man so he is god in a seeable form so in another way of putting that is that christ is god in a seeable form christ is god in a meetable form and so uh, we could borrow illustration from our electricity or our day-to-day -day experiences they are poor but let's just borrow it electricity is dangerous because the the, the wires when they are naked they carry so much voltage and they can actually electrocute escape. someone could die from touching them but now you now put a conductor around it and now that same wire that is dangerous, a little kid or a person can be playing with it because it's been insulated. So we could say God has made himself meetable, reachable, approachable in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy. Because I said God dwells in unapproachable light. So the God who dwells in unapproachable light is beholdable through Christ. So without that, how are we going to behold him? We just be having all kinds of similitude or phantom images in our hearts. We might be idolatry. And so it's not like we see God in our face or something like a physical form, but there's something in us that can relate with God because our spirit is one spirit with the Lord. So God that dwells in unapproachable light has made himself approachable in the person of Jesus Christ. So our job, our calling is that to abide in him he said that i have chosen you that uh, that abide in me and i in you he said that where i am that you may be also he selected the disciples the twelve that they may be with him so at first our priority is to be with him like they said of the apostles i didn't ask for that they realize that they have been with christ 
Christ as the living word is the face of God. So how do I how do I behold God? Principal medium beholding the word, meditating on the word, letting the word transform us, letting the word change our being, letting the word do its regeneration or transformation or confirmation work in our life to the image of Christ. So he is the word of God so that we can behold God. And I think it's in Psalm 32 that um, that they uh, that as they uh, that they were lightened. I think Psalm 32 was it or there about that they look unto him and they were lightened and their faces and they were not put to shame. So the face of Christ is the originator of all things. That's the medium through which all things came into being. That is the uh, will I call it the 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 the, the mode because the face essentially we can call the face the word of God which is what God has revealed about himself. That's how we get to know God. That same word is what created the heavens and the earth. So his face also controls all things. He upholds all things by the word of his power. So as the power of God as well, he also controls all things. All things are subject to him. He has preeminence over all things. All things have been made to bow before his name. So when we are talking about the person of Christ as the face of God, we are talking about comprehensively about the totality of his being in our, will I say, relationship with God, in our contact with God. In him, all things have their center of unity. And uh, let me read Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Anything outside of Christ will disintegrate. So it is through him all things have their center. Verse verse 17 says and is before all things and in him all things consist that means all things are held together is the hope that holds the will together of the universe verse 18 and is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence that he might have the first place in everything in every situation he appoints to everything its place so it is through him because it's also the administrator of the universe is also the ruler of the kings of the earth. So we're not talking of just a mere title. We are talking of the, the one that actually controls everything that has been handed over to him. So he appoints to everything to its place. That's why our joy is that he's our elder brother, our Lord, our husband. He's the face of God. So when people want to see God, we say, just come and look at us because we are members of his body to express him. So he appoints to everything its place. He determines the relation of things to one another. Right from creation, he created the heavens and the earth. And also the sustenance of all things. The, for example, we give our carbon dioxide to the plant kingdom. The plant kingdom gives us oxygen. And this is his wisdom. Because it's the one that upholds all and created all so for his pleasure. So he's the one who combines all things orderly so that the universe is a cosmos and not a chaos. And we can see this in the, in the wisdom of God and the arrangement of things. If I go back to Hebrew, sorry, first uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him and what that means is like is the me is the source through him all things it is of him all things were created through him is the medium for the sustenance of all things and for him is that is the is the is the destination is the reason for the creation of anything the reason for the creation of anything in christ is the end reason for it his faith perfects all things and that's why scriptures enjoys us to behold him as in a mirror that's how our perfection comes into be by beholding the Lord. Because in beholding the Lord, what happens is like His life and His spirit is ministered to us. Almost similar to when the solar system is exposed to the sun. And because now our spirit is now exposed to Him as we behold His word. And now more of the divine virtue is dispensed into us. He is not only the head and origin of all, but also the goal of the entire universe. The goal, all things consist in him. I will say that the universe was the universe was created for him. <laughs> and that's why in Revelation chapter 4, 
when the 24 elders and the heavenly host were singing unto the Lord. That verse, let me read from verse maybe 9. Uh, and the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and cast the crowns before his throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and they exist by your and they exist and were created revelations chapter 5 let me read from verse 5 it says revelations 5 5 but one of the elders said to me do not weep behold the lion of the tribe of judah the root of david has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals and i looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood the lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So is the creative cause that is the source, is the continuous cause, is the upholding, and it's also the consummating and that is the final destination of all existence. Is the author and the finisher of our faith. So is the beginning, the way from the beginning and also the end of all things. What a joy to the greatness of God in Christ. So God's eternal purpose for his creation advances and attains his ultimate end through him so how do we find out the eternal purpose of god is going to point back to christ how do we find what the agenda of god is for the hour for the season for our nation for our families for our ministries for our health for our life for our spouses for our children is going to go back to him because we were created for his own pleasure to be conformed to his image is the center is, is that's why god the father said no one can come to me except the Father draws them. So the Father is always drawing people to Him, to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit as well has come to bear witness of Him. So He's the, he's, he's the syllabus of our Christian faith. He's the curriculum in there because it is Him we are being conformed to His glorious image. He who is the agent of creation is also its aim. So the one who started creation is also the destination. <laughs> the Creator is also the aim or the goal of everything that is in existence. So reading ahead in that Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, and because the book of Revelation is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a ham, a ham and a golden bowls of full of incense which are the prayers of the saint so that which proceeded from him is also sustained by him and converges towards him so the prayers of the saints in revelations 5 verse 8 and verse 9 says and they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you are slain and have redeemed us to god by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to God, and we shall reign on the earth. Why are we reigning on the earth? Because of Christ. His face is light above light. There are light and there are lights. <laughs> light has its degrees, it has its level. Christ, the light of God, is an effulgence of the brightness of God. So his face is light upon. That's why we are enlightened. And that's why that prayer in Ephesians 1, it's in that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened, that we may know the hope of His calling and the exceeding greatness of His power towards us. So there's a lot of benefit, tremendous benefit in meditating on the person of Christ, in beholding Him, because it is in that light we see light. In this light we see light. It's the true light that gives light to every man on the earth. His, his face is also wisdom above wisdom. There are wisdom, there is there's the natural wisdom, there's the demonic wisdom, and there's the wisdom of God as well. And the wisdom of God is supreme. The wisdom of God is a person, and it's the wisdom of God God uses to create heaven. So the wisdom of God is such that it is a wisdom that every other wisdom is silent before. Every other wisdom bows to its authority because in the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God can use the unlikely means to achieve the highest purpose because it is God and it never fails. Because of God's infinite knowledge, His wisdom is also unhearable. That is, it is unmist it can make mistake. 
there is no such because it has fallen in every possible contingency. His face is joy to the miserable. That's why he enjoys us. Say, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So where people are downcasted, weak, depressed, we invite them to the Lord Jesus Christ because it's the face of God that ministers joy to our heart. And that's why Philippians and a lot of scripture tells us that rejoice in the Lord and the power of his mind. Said so in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world in John 16. So continually our eyes are on the Lord because that's where strength comes from. So are you a minister of the gospel? Are you um, into in the workplace, in the marketplace, a politician, entertain in the entertainment world, whatever field you are in, it is, it is from Christ we behold continually so that we can minister life in anything we are doing. Because that's what makes the difference between a believer and a regular person that is not a believer. There's a river of living water flowing through us because we are beholding the Lord. His face is the dazzling brightness of God's glory like we looked at in Hebrews chapter 1. and Which is why for us I believe is our priority every day, every hour in a sense. Yeah, because we are conversing with the Lord, we are beholding Him. And it doesn't mean we are sitting passively and just looking at the sky, but there is a posture of the heart. We are beholding Him so that His life is dispensed continually into us because we are releasing life anywhere we go. We become an environment or an atmosphere of the presence of God anywhere we are, right? So His face is also strength to the weary. So that's why He's the bread of life, is the water of life, is the word of life, is the spirit of life, is the author of life, is the fountain of life. So everything of everything that gives life to because as creatures in Adam, falling in Adam, we redeem now, we still need that life of God continually and it gives us strength the scripture says that that i can do all things through christ who strengthens me so the face of christ is strength to the weary just looking at him i remember in the wilderness in numbers when the israelites were sinning and they disobeyed god and god told moses to erect uh, a brazen serpent on the pole and as they behold that brazen serpent as many that looked to it and weren't bothered about the situation around they were healed and so even today, as the Lord repeated that same uh, account in John 3, that we look unto Him, it is by looking unto Him that we now receive the life to deal with any serpent or situations or circumstances in our, in our area, in our terrain. So Christ is all of God, the life of God, the wisdom of God, the glory of God, the power of God, everything of God, and also God is all of Christ. Everything about Christ is just that every revelation of who Christ is to us, that is actually who God is to us. But God is that to us through the person of Christ. God is our husband through Christ. God is our shepherd through Christ. God is our father through Christ. God is our savior through Christ. God is our sanctifier through Christ. God is our nourisher through Christ. Everything that the father is to us is always in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he is the face of God. He is the contact point, the bridge between divinity and humanity. The one mediator between God and man. What a joy to the greatness of our God. Christ being all of God and God all of Christ. So his face is God's love to us. The face of God. In, because you look at a person and you can, the person smiles, it's contagious. And you can, you can see the expression of it. Say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to us. Romans 8.32 also attests to it that if he did not spare his only son. So we won't know God loves us until we see what Christ went through for us. Although that love existed from eternity past. It's not because Christ died that God loved us. That love has existed because Ephesians 1 says that because of his love, God had brought us in union with Christ even before the world was created. That means we even had a history before creation started. That's another topic right there. So, but we see the fact that God's love is made tangible to us. We can now see that this is the love of God. This is the love of God, the high, holy joy. The seven spirits of God are mysteriously designed in Revelation 5 6. I think we read part of it there where it says that, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood the Lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. It's a mystery. That's, that's it right there. 
is I think we've done a topic and found the seven Christ has the seven eyes of God or the seven spirit has the eyes of Christ in, in within that context. I actually got most of the notes from there from Brother Witness, lead of blessed memory of how the this is for because the church had got into a decadent state, Revelations 2 3, and now the intensified sevenfold spirit of God, which are the eyes of Christ, which is the person of Christ essentially, now comes in order to do his purging work in his church. So those the seven spirits of God are mysteriously his eyes. It's mysterious. We can't explain. We, we don't have words. We just worship and adore him for the greatness of his being. What a joy. So, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts. Second Corinthians chapter 4, and the verse 4, like 4, 5, 6. So, what Satan desires to do is to darken the minds of men, of creatures. Because it is true that it is not really so bothered about physical, it is the eyes of the heart. Because that's where God's dwelling wants, that's where God wants to dwell in every man's heart. So he darkens the hearts of the unbelievers, their mind, so that they will not let the light of the glorious gospel of God to flow into them. But God always, his goal is always to say, let there be light. Like he did in creation in Genesis chapter 1. Let there be light when there was gross darkness. In the new creation, it's still the same rule. But this time, instead of gross darkness on the surface of the earth, there's darkness in the heart of man. So God is also shining forth his light into the heart of man. And that's why we are now the light of the world. To bring the good news of Christ so that light will come into the heart. So that the day star will arise and spring forth in the heart of men. So who has shown in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So today we've been able to look at the topic Christ has the face of God. We said that Christ, the Lord said in John 14 verse 9 that he that has seen him has seen the Father. So if we want to know the Father, we look at Christ. We cannot know God outside of Christ. God is unknowable. I think it's the last page. God is unknowable outside of Christ. God is unmeetable outside of Christ. There is no revelation of God that is distinct from Christ because Christ is God revealed to humanity. Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Christ is God manifest among men. So even till date, we still need God manifested in our lives, in our situation. And it is through the person of Christ. Actually, that is the good news. The good news is that God was in Christ reconciling this world to himself. God is still reconciling the world to himself. God is still manifesting himself to us today. And is manifesting himself through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we keep beholding the Lord the face of God so that we can be transformed from glory to glory. What a joy to the greatness of God. Hallelujah to God the Father. Hallelujah to God the Son. Hallelujah to God the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.